everybody, and welcome to Trendlines, a podcast on global affairs brought to you by World Politics Review. I'm Judah Grunstein, WPR's editor-in-chief, and I'm joined by WPR managing editor, Freddie Decknatel. Hi, Freddie. Hey, Judah. We'll be talking about the U.S.-China Phase 1 trade deal that was signed Wednesday and the surprise resignation of Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev and his cabinet that same day. Before we get started, just a quick reminder for everyone listening that the interview episode of the podcast went live Wednesday. Elliot spoke with Peter Tinty about the potential implications of a U.S. military drawdown in Africa for Washington's engagement with various governments across the continent. Uh, Freddie, the uh, the U.S.-China trade deal that we saw signed Wednesday seems to follow a familiar pattern for uh, President Donald Trump. Create a crisis, cause a lot of pain to both sides, including the U.S., and then find an off-ramp that's basically the status quo ante, but maybe a little worse. It's a, yeah, it's a microcosm, um, again, um, of the Trump administration, uh, of, a, of Trump claiming a victory um, for... Uh, a problem, nevertheless, that he started uh, in terms of this trade war, uh, claiming concessions that China didn't actually really agree to. Um, the text of the deal didn't come out until after it was signed yesterday, and as most uh, you know, trade experts and just other observers uh, expected, um, a lot of the claims in there um, are things that China has either already committed itself to or are, are quite vague and will be hard to enforce. Uh, you know, one thing in particular, you know, Trump's been promoting this idea that China is going to buy $50 billion worth of American agricultural products. Um, it's significantly less than that. It's something like 35 or $40 billion, um, over the next two years, according to the deal. But again, even those sort of terms are, are somewhat vague, even though that number is in the agreement. Um, and again, it's 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 more than anything designed to appeal to Trump's base, um, and it's sort of a, re, a a reelection strategy more than anything, so that he can tell American farmers that uh, he's doing something for them, even though it's his trade deal, among other things, that uh, has been hurting them over the last few years. And significantly, the Chinese uh, translation of the text has not yet been made official, I believe. Um, and, uh, they're already in the, in the English text, uh, there are little clauses such as, uh, these, these purchases will be made according to market conditions and things like that, which seem to give a little bit of wiggle room. Um, in, in all fairness, the, the, there are other, there are other aspects of the deal or other, other parts of the deal that improve access to the Chinese market in certain sectors, uh, for agricultural products in terms of, uh, uh, regulations, sanitary regulations, for instance, that had been used by China, uh, to prevent, uh, exports, uh, American exports, financial services as well. Um, other things China's already agreed to before, like intellectual property protection uh, and, and and other uh, elements uh, of the deal. Um, some of it, China doesn't actually rec- recognize itself as being in violation of, of uh, any, uh, any norms or regulations. Uh, so it's almost like they're agreeing to something that they already believe they're abiding by. Uh, but, but again, uh, the follow through is going to be the big, uh, the big issue. Um, some of that will be hard to guarantee. There seems to be a lot of wiggle room. Uh, the enforcement mechanism uh, is unproven. I think what struck me about uh, those purchasing agreements is, is that after all of the, the pain and suffering that the, that the tariffs and the trade war have co- cost, uh, it, it ultimately this deal is, is almost like an enforced purchasing agreement. Uh, So instead of a liberalized trade and a free market, it's almost like wage and price controls where the U.S. government has dictated to China how much China has to buy from American producers, which uh, it seems like quite a shift for the uh, for Republican uh, trade policy. Uh, Yeah, the hawks that are in the China hawks in the administration, um, like Robert Lighthizer and others, you know, their whole goal for years, you know, predating Trump was to try to get China to agree to, you know, change change its trade practices um, fundamentally and and sort of get on side with the U.S. um, over its economic policy in a lot of ways. And what this deal does doesn't pursue any of that, really. It just gets these commitments from Beijing to buy a certain amount of soybeans and, and, and other agricultural commodities from the U.S. Um, so there isn't 
this longstanding demand that um, has been part of the Republican Party, and then, you know, especially among these people who are very hawkish on on China when it comes to trade, they're not getting what they claim they're getting or what they say they've been trying to get all along out of out of these tariffs. Um, and the flip side to that here in the United States is that, um, you know, for all the talk of liberalized trade and things like that. Trump has been, uh, because one of the costs of the trade war here in the U.S. is uh, for American farmers, there's been a huge bailout to try to, you know, compensate for the costs of rising tariffs and the fact that um, the market for soybeans and other American agricultural products in China is so much less. So, you know, for all the talk of socialism uh, or criticism that, you know, the government uh, has too heavy of a hand in, 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 in the market or something like that, the Trump administration has gone out of its way to involve the U.S. government much more in the American farm industry um, purely to pay for what is basically a political mistake, and that's, you know, making um, life that much harder for farmers for the sake of this trade war, again, whose sort of point is still a mystery because they're not getting the concessions out of Beijing that they say they want. And now in terms of market inter- intervention, you have the this added step of not only the, the, the bailouts that you mentioned, uh, but now the government, the U.S. government is basically picking winners by identifying specific uh, sectors and industries and uh, even down to various products uh, in some of the annexes to the agreement that the Chinese have to uh, import from now on. Um, the, the, the agreement, uh, I, I didn't read, uh, all 95 pages of the text, but I did scan it and it seems almost as if it's, it, it, it's certainly in two parts. One seems to be the Lighthizer deal and the other seems to be the Trump deal. And the Lighthizer deal has to do with, um, improving access to the Chinese market, um, putting in certain, uh, conditions and and dispute resolution mechanisms, uh, trying to enforce intellectual property protection, things like that, which were, again, low-hanging fruit because a lot of it China has already agreed to before, and the problem has always been getting them to follow through uh, and enforcing it. And then the second part of the deal is the Trump deal, which is basically uh, $200 billion in purchases so that Trump can say he reduced the trade deficit, uh, again, which most uh, economists and trade analysts uh, agree is is not a real indicator uh, necessarily of uh, the degree to which China is is uh, is tilting trade in its favor. China certainly is doing that, uh, but the, the 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 trade deficit is not necessarily the best indicator, uh, and it has to do with other structural uh, factors that that uh, a, a trade deficit doesn't actually address. Um, again, a lot of the harder stuff. Uh, that the trade hawks like Peter Navarro or even uh, Robert Lighthizer uh, will want to get are going to be coming in what would be a phase two deal, which would have to do with Chinese subsidies for state-owned enterprises, uh, things like that, uh, especially with regard to uh, IT and high tech in terms of China's ambitions to to lead the the uh, technical uh, revolution, the next stage of it anyway. And so all of those uh, ways in which China uh, creates market imbalances and 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 picks winners uh, to the to the disadvantage of American companies and and foreign companies in general. None of those has been have been addressed. And as you said, it's really hard to know uh, for with regard to the Trump administration uh, how committed Trump actually is to any of that stuff. Now that he's pocketed his two hundred billion in in new purchases, um, and and whether the Chinese really are willing to go through with uh, with that kind of painful negotiation because in a lot of ways this sort of hits the pause button there's been pain but not as much as as maybe both sides expected and China I think at this point might must feel relatively if not pleased at least uh, uh, not particularly alarmed at at the status quo uh, currently they feel like they can weather the storm in terms of the tariffs that remained in place and just buy some time uh, to to improve their position for the next stage of uh, negotiations. I think they've gotten a sense of, um, you know, on the one hand, how far Trump is willing to go, but then also, um, you know, the limits to that, because, you know, they, you know, the first year or two of the trade war, um, when all these rounds of tariffs were imposed, many of them, you know, starting by, you know, some pronouncement on Twitter from Trump, there was a sense that, you know, Chinese officials were caught off guard and that maybe they had, you know, taken... uh, 
a sort of softer view of Trump that he wouldn't necessarily fall through on this stuff. But then even though, you know, the trade war has had economic costs and, you know, the tariffs have continued to be escalated, Trump has also shown that he he understands or at least suggests that he understands the costs of it because he's held back on some of his threats. Um, you know, the threat most of all to impose a whole swath of new tariffs that would have taken effect in December uh, on basically every, you know, kind of product Americans um, buy that's manufactured in China, you know, right around the holiday season, um, that looked like an empty threat from Trump. And it ended up being that because they backed off. And, you know, obviously Trump's and the Trump administration's line would be that that's how they got China to agree to this phase one deal by threatening to impose even more tariffs at a time when neither economy would want to see that um, take effect. But again, you know, what did they get out of those threats? This deal doesn't really promise very much at all. Um, and it's certainly much less than what Trump has chalked it up to be. Uh, and then, you know, coming back to the idea that this is, you know, for domestic messaging here in the U.S. and it's part of a, re- a re-election strategy, um, as Kimberly Ann Elliott pointed out in her column this week, there's a question, too, about the fact that there's so limited tariff relief um, beyond agriculture. Um, so manufacturing in the U.S., which has also suffered a lot from the rise in prices of aluminum, for example, uh, and other inputs that American manufacturers um, need. And, you know, there's a lot of e- economic indicators that manufacturing um, is not, you know, rebounding like Trump claims. Um, and so while this might sort of be a sop to uh, one part of Trump's base in sort of the you know, agricultural Midwest, there's other key swing states in the Rust Belt that are hurting and are going to continue to hurt and are not going to see any, any any benefit as part of this deal. So in terms of a, a re-election ploy, it really only goes halfway for Trump. And so there's a question of, you know, how that will end up playing out, um, given that there are still large parts of the electorate, especially that are paying the price of these higher tariffs. It's a really good point. And again, in all fairness, if uh, the Chinese do follow through on the purchases. And if they do follow through on the commitments to improve access to American companies um, to the Chinese market, and if they do follow through on the promises to protect intellectual pro- property and not force uh, companies that want to do business in China to turn over their intellectual property uh, to domestic firms, uh, it, it will be meaningful progress, modest progress, but meaningful progress to restoring a a little more balance to the trade relationship. I think there are a couple um, other aspects and broader implications that that are also somewhat troubling. The first is uh, that it's a bilateral agreement. So rather than working with uh, allies, for instance, in Europe, uh, or even through the WTO, so that all countries around the world ha- enjoy the same protections and the same access to the Chinese market, and and to re uh, to, to to shore up the the the, the global trade regime, uh, it's it's a bilateral. So at this point, uh, uh, only American companies are protected under this deal. So that has pretty big implications for Europe, for instance, which must be watching and saying, okay, now we know uh, if we want anything with regard to China, we got to take care of ourselves. It's not going to be within the WTO, uh, for instance. The other thing is that there's all sorts of counterintuitive aspects to this kind of agreement in the sense that um, I, I think the, the the deeper trends that the trade war and the tariffs have put into motion, especially in China, are that both countries really probably see the danger of too much economic inter- interdependence. And so even if in the short term this increases uh, commerce and economic inter- interdependence, I don't think uh, it's been lost on China that they would really like to make their market more independent of American goods and even, for that matter, exports to America to make them less vulnerable to this kind of uh, the, the kind of leverage that Trump used over them with the tariffs. And I guess the final counterintuitive thing is that, you know, when when you that the deal has given China quite a bit of power to influence American domestic politics and the American economy, because two hundred billion dollars is it's a substantial amount of trade it's not a it's not a, an enormous amount of trade compared to or enormous a, a number compared to uh, for instance the American defense budget or uh, or global trade or, or Chinese exports in general but it's a, sub, a substantial number and to the extent that uh, China sees it in their in their interest to do so they now have the power to shut that switch off 
and cause Trump a lot of embarrassment and even some political damage in terms of the states that might benefit from those added purchases. So I think all told, uh, the, the, the deal in, in principle rep represents some modest progress, uh, but in practice it leaves a lot of uh, important questions unanswered and it, it has some counterintuitive uh, implications both for the world and for the U.S., and it, I think the only thing I would add, too, is it shows the risk of uh, this transactional approach to trade that Trump um, has been trying to pursue since he came into office. I mean, this is, in a lot of ways, the sort of perfect uh, image of that, you know, China agreeing to buy X amount of this product in exchange for uh, the U.S., you know, agreeing bilaterally to, you know, ease some tariffs. It's extremely transactional. It's a very... Um, you know, old-fashioned approach to trade uh, between these two countries, not going through any broader multilateral agreement or framework. Um, and, you know, Trump can claim that he alone got China to, you know, increase its purchases by this many billions of dollars. But also, as you say, it's just as likely, or not just as likely, but there's the possibility that China could, if there's another uh, obstacle or hiccup, you know, cut off those purchases. And that's the problem of having that kind of transactionalism. You, you mentioned that at the signing ceremony, uh, the, the Chinese Vice Premier Liu uh, was was probably seeing a level of obsequiousness to Trump that uh, that rivaled what he sees in Beijing to uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, I think the Chinese have a pretty sophisticated understanding of the mentality and the psychology of a leader like Trump, and I think they're perfectly happy to satisfy his ego uh, to buy some time. Uh, and I think that uh, it's in 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 the long run, very little has been resolved, and that uh, that uh, the trade war, uh, regardless of of short term outcomes, uh, I think when ten years from now, when we look back on the evolution of the U.S. China relationship, it will obviously be a turning point, uh, particularly in how China views the relationship and and the kind of steps that they'll take to try to insulate uh, themselves from uh, from this kind of uh, vulnerability in the future. Um, moving on to Russia, uh, obviously very opaque, hard to know what's going on in the Kremlin. Uh, what we do know is that uh, the Prime Minister, Dmitry Medvedev, resigned uh, on Wednesday. Parliament's already approved Mikhail Mishustin as his replacement. Uh, from what I've read, uh, Mishustin is a pretty well-regarded technocrat, uh, effective uh, at uh, his previous job, in which he overhauled the country's tax collection system, uh, so seen as uh, as effective and uh, somewhat apolitical. Um, uh, but Medvedev's surprise announcement followed uh, President Vladimir Putin's State of the Federation speech, uh, also on Wednesday, in which Putin proposed strengthening the parliament and the prime minister's office, as well as a, a sort of second-tier uh, institution, the state council. Uh, so it's being seen initially as a way to leave several avenues uh, open to Putin to extend his rule. He's facing a constitutional term limit of two consecutive terms uh, in 2024. Uh, and even though uh, Russia is an authoritarian system and a, and a, a repressive regime, uh, it, apparently Putin still sees the, uh, the usefulness of respecting at least the letter of the law when it comes to the Constitution. Yeah, you need to at least have the veneer of uh, going along with the Constitution or, 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 you know, not completely flouting institutions to maintain uh, that veneer of legitimacy. Um, we had an in-depth article in November looking at the protests uh, that took place in Moscow mainly last summer, um, looking at uh, the young activists of quote-unquote, Generation Putin, uh, you know, young Russians who have grown up only under one president. And um, it seems like that generation is only going to grow. Um, and the fear, and I think it's looking now more like an expectation, that there will be um, a much longer generation of Russians who have only known one president, um, you know, putting aside the brief little interlude where Medvedev was made president, uh, but Putin was still really running the show behind the scenes. Um, I saw a picture uh, that, uh, I don't know if it was a Russian journalist um, or an American journalist that posted on Twitter that they said was sort of making the rounds uh, in Moscow that was a picture of Putin, but aged to look gray and old. Um, and someone pointed out that uh, it was probably inaccurate because he was going to keep, you know, the um, miracles of Botox and, and everything else that Putin probably already uses to hide his age. Um, 
that even if he's an old man, he'll still probably look like he does today. The, the, that article pointed out that uh, Generation Putin, for the most part, is, has been relatively docile, politically, uh, politically apathetic, um, not very involved in politics. There is this sort of uh, smaller group of younger activists that's emerging. Um, but f- more broadly in Russia, there has been uh, more and more public discontent and popular discontent, grievances, um, uh, protests over uh, an unpopular pension reform last year. Uh, and again, uh, Putin's decision to run again as president in 2012, after having served as prime minister, uh, did spark some massive protests along with uh, the the elections that year that, that were widely seen as rigged. So I think that that history and the memory of that, um, which also had very uh, important implications for the relationship with the U.S., because Putin uh, seemed to uh, to really blame those protests on American instigators um, and and uh, so there were there was some some implications for relations with the U.S. But I think the memory of that of what happened in 2012 has caused him to be a little more um, more cautious, especially especially in in the climate uh, of of Russia today. Um, there's there's also I think something that's um, that that's under discussed and and particularly in the West where Putin is seen as this tactical and strategic master and how he's uh, it, it runs uh, Russia. Russia with an iron fist when, in fact, uh, as Mark Galliotti, who who's written for us and has been on the podcast with Elliot, put it, uh, he calls it more an ad hocracy, uh, where there there's a lot of uh, policy entrepreneurs who are sort of trying things outside of the chain of the command chain of command, and when it works, they bring it to Putin, and he he sort of endorses it, and when it doesn't, they they uh, feel the wrath. Um, but but the truth is that the regime in Russia is a, a lot of different factions, and uh, whether it's reformers or uh, old security hands, um, business uh, business people, uh, clean and dirty oligarchs uh, who are who are corrupt, uh, and and I think the big question in Russia is whether there's anyone in Russia who can hold all those various factions of the regime together besides Putin. Um, and then for on, on the international level, whether there's anyone who, having done that, could be as effective as Putin in terms of leveraging love, Russia's relatively weak hand for the kind of influence he's managed to 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 have in international affairs. Um, so I think that uh, that fragility in terms of no real successor and no no um, institutional strength or capacity uh, beyond the individual. Uh, sort of limits his hand and almost forces his hand that that he does have to stay on until there is some sort of uh, promised succession or that that can maintain stability. Yeah, the problem with uh, you know sidelining your rivals and weakening um, the opposition and and sort of doing all the things Putin has done to strengthen his his position, uh, you, you know, less through an iron grip and more just by trying to you know dilute institutions of the state and throw opposition members in jail and you know certainly some of those do are quite authoritarian but you know as you said a lot of it's much more um sort of just regime management and negotiation uh but the problem with doing all that is then you have no you know anointed successor uh necessarily and um i think there is the question of a, you know there have been other examples of other of other authoritarian regimes and other you know semi-democratic systems where um uh, that sort of runs its course and that at some point it does get exhausted and um, whether pr- protests erupt or, you know, if, if you've uh, made yourself indispensable uh, as the leader, um, the time does eventually run out. Uh, I've seen some suggestion that, uh, that Putin is uh taking a page out of the playbook of uh, Kazakhstan's uh, longtime uh, former ruler, uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, who relinquished the presidency to a a longtime right-hand man, uh, but took uh, took sort of control behind the scenes at the head of a newly empowered state council or national security council, I think it's called there. Um, And so whether 
uh, Putin becomes prime minister again uh, with uh, strength and powers or whether he oversees things as head of the state council, there's some suggestion that he's going to be uh, moving to a, a more behind the scenes role, but uh, still in control. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see as things develop, uh, it still leaves that long term question of what do you do to actually groom a successor, but also uh, maybe uh, put into place the institutional capacity uh, to to uh, to to maintain stability, uh, regardless of whether a handpicked su successor uh, is is placed in, parachuted into power or not. All right, obviously more to follow on both of those stories in the months ahead. Time to get to some WPR articles we want to flag for everyone listening. Freddie, which one did you have in mind? Jeremy Ude's briefing uh, looking at the risks of African swine fever in particular in China, but also what it says about the state of the global health governance system, which still tends to divide animal health from human health. Uh, and Jeremy does a great job of explaining why they're increasingly so connected. It's a, it's a great article, and I'd like to think of it in, as an example of something we always uh, try to do at WPR, which is, uh, in addition to covering uh, some of the, the top-line news and the, the, the headline stories, to cover very important and significant trends and developments uh, that might be quieter stories, uh, but that have some, uh, some real uh, implications and impact uh, on not only health in this case, but policy and uh, global governance. So... Uh, great article. And I'll mention Sarah Suli's in-depth article about Greece's crackdown on asylum seekers and refugees. After a landslide victory in last July's elections, the government of Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis began instituting a new hardline asylum policy. It was ostensibly to speed up processing times for asylum claims to alleviate the country's notoriously overcrowded refugee camps. But as Sarah explains, the new approach is part and parcel of the government's law and order agenda and includes not only raising the bar for gaining asylum, but also a securitization of migration policy that is increasingly putting migrants and refugees at risk of physical violence. All right, two things I want to mention before we get to the Who Said That segment. First, if you'd like to stay up to date on everything we cover at WPR, go ahead and sign up for our daily newsletter at wpr.pub slash trendlines. In addition to free access to selected articles and a rundown of everything else we've published, you'll also get a promotional code for a 25% discount if you decide you'd like to take the next step and subscribe to WPR. Again, the URL is wpr.pub slash trendlines. And second, if you'd like to drop us a line with questions or comments, you can email us at podcast at worldpoliticsreview.com. All right, Freddie, time for Who Said That? What do you got for me? All right, I'm going to take out the country name that appears in this quote. There's an odor of mendacity throughout this issue, mendacity and hubris. The problem is there is a disincentive, really, to tell the truth. We have created an incentive to almost require people to lie. I just watched this uh the video of this testimony uh, this morning. It's the, uh, I forget his name and official title, but it's the U.S. government official who's responsible for oversight of uh, reconstruction efforts in Afghanistan, uh, talking about the, the various uh, pressures put on uh, Defense Department officials and other government agency officials uh, to, bet, to put uh, the government's efforts in Afghanistan in the best light possible. Yeah, that's right. The Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, uh, who told Congress about uh, the pressure on U.S. officials to lie about everything from the number of Afghan children who were enrolled in schools um, to life expectancy in the country, uh, among other issues around the uh, military uh, situation on the ground there, things that were revealed um, in the so-called Afghanistan papers that were released late, la late last year. All right. I've got a who said that, but afterward, I've, I've got a, a special who wrote that as well. So uh, here's the who said that. We didn't want to look weak, so we agreed to keep the existence of the threat a secret. Mm, it's just, well, I, I, there's been so many shifting explanations from the Trump administration about the uh, killing of Soleimani, um, Qasem Soleimani. So I wonder, is this Trump or someone in his administration? It, it's, it's a reasonable guess, but it's actually a European official uh, quoted by the Washington Post about the Trump administration's threat to impose 25% tariffs on European automobiles. 
if the European signatories to the Iran nuclear deal didn't invoke the deal's dispute resolution mechanism. Uh, the Europeans had been preparing to tri trigger the clause for weeks as a last-ditch effort to salvage the deal, uh, and uh, they, they wanted to avoid the appearance of uh, cowing under uh, another Trump threat. Uh, here's the who wrote that. Uh, it's uh, you can it, you can if you get uh, e either of the countries involved, uh, you can count that as a, a correct a answer. Uh, here's the quote: feathers, heads, intestines, and tails of poultry. It's a it's a deal signed and agreed to by two different countries. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's actually uh, item E of Appendix 1 to Chapter 3 of the U.S.-China trade deal that they just signed Wednesday, uh, which lists, quote, products that are not eligible for importation into China, including when incorporated into further processed products. Uh, the rest of the list gets pretty grisly, but uh, that just jumped out at me. All right. Uh, great stuff, Freddie. Thanks. Thanks, Judah. If you'd like to stay up to date on everything we cover at WPR, go ahead and sign up for our daily newsletter at wpr.pub slash trendlines. In addition to free access to selected WPR articles all week long, you'll also get a promotional code for a 25% discount on a WPR subscription. And if you'd like to send comments or questions, email us at podcast at worldpoliticsreview.com. Trendlines is produced and edited by Peter Dury. You can follow him and World Politics Review on Twitter, and you can find links to pieces covering the issues we talked about in the show notes on worldpoliticsreview.com. Have a great weekend, and see you next week for two new episodes of Trendlines.